reinforce why I like GoToWebinar better, uh, but still kind of clunky in the Q&A interface, but kind of got it up here. Um, okay, we had a uh, um, comment from somebody is asking, is there any way to increase the volume? Um, no, I, I actually don't have a way of increasing volume on these, um, it, it, and I don't want to get too tied up in, in this, but if you, if you did have some issues with the volume, um, let me know. There is a post on the uh, RBCS blog page, it's from uh, about a month ago, from a fellow who um, um, had some, some audio issues, and if you, if you did have audio issues and you can't find that out on the blog, uh, let me know, and I'll, I'll uh, we'll forward forward you the link to that um, to that post, um, and see if that helps. Um, let's see. Uh, And a couple of people commented they were not able to see the slides. Again, latest version of IE, um, you might have problems with that. So um, probably want to uh, think about using another browser for till GoToWebinar gets their Citrix more properly gets gets their problems with IE resolved. I, I got a blog post on that too. It's kind of surprising that the level of compatibility testing that does or doesn't go on. Okay, so Venkata asks, uh, what is a good tool we can use for code coverage testing? Hmm. Um, well, I guess this, this, this depends. Um, I mean, if you, if you do not have any budget for this, then what you're going to want to do is look at the, look at the freeware um, options, of, of which there are many um, associated with uh, typically the, the sort of the agile world. So, you know, all sorts of add-ons for, for Hudson and so forth that do um, code coverage tracking. Um, and then there are uh, uh, commercial tools that will do that. So, you know, what I would do is say, you know, like any sort of tool selection, what you want to do is first understand your, your requirements and constraints. I mean, are you doing this during system testing or are you doing it during a unit test? Do you have a budget for this or are you going to have to do this for free? Once you understand those constraints, you then should be able to do a um, web search, Google or Yahoo or something, and find a fairly substantial number of tools that will meet your basic requirements and constraints. And then at that point, you want to go through an evaluation process to select the one that, uh, that you actually uh, want to use. Nikos here is suggesting Eclipse. Um, I, I'm not aware of that myself, but I, I would not be at all surprised if there's stuff that's um, that uh, will plug in for that. So it should be easy enough to check to see. I mean, if you just do a web search, Eclipse code coverage, um, you should be able to find information on that. Um, okay, let's see. So Tish asks, is code coverage the right med trick to measure the quality of QA tests? That is an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, it is a metric of the quality of your tests. It is a, um, a measure of the, the thoroughness of the tests with respect to the code. Now, I'll point, let me point out something. A code, you could get 100% statement coverage, decision coverage, and MCDC coverage and get loop coverage at the zero times, one time, and n times um, level and still miss all sorts of bugs. Um, and you might say, well, how could that be? Well, the way it could be is if the requirements are wrong or if there are missing requirements, um, then you know, guess what? You, you, there's code that's, that's there that conforms to the requirement, but the requirement is wrong. So there's code that, that does the wrong thing because the requirements are wrong. Or in the case of missing requirements, there's there's just no code there. Um, so um, you don't want to you don't want to look at this. Um, what's the right word here? Not unilaterally, but uh, 
you don't want to fixate on this alone. You don't want to say, oh, if, if my tests have gotten 100% statement, loop, decision, and uh, MCDC coverage, then my tests are perfect and the system is perfect. No. Um, it, this is one way of measuring how much confidence you should have in your tests. And there are other things that we, should, we do want to look at, like requirements coverage or for the, the, the Agile world, user story coverage. Um, you want to look at design coverage. Uh, if you support a lot of different configurations, you want to look at configuration combination coverage. Uh, if you're doing risk-based testing, you want to look at risk coverage. Um, there, there are uh, a number of, um, of uh, different uh, coverage um, uh, measures, I guess, I guess I would say. And this is, we're just talking about code coverage here. So, so be careful not to sort of overload code coverage with a whole bunch of uh, uh, meanings that it that it doesn't uh, doesn't actually have. Um, this is a this is a very common mistake. So I'm I'm really glad that you uh, that you asked the question. Um, let's see. Okay, yes. T says risk based test coverage is really helpful. Thanks, Rex. Yeah, that's that. T Keep that in mind. If you're doing risk-based testing, that's what you're looking for is appropriate coverage of, of all the risk items you've identified. Um, let's see. Apollo um, asked, do you know some tool? Oops. Do you know some tool for Java and .NET that helps choose the data for use in tests? And for example, if I have a method that should to calc A, B, but was implemented B, A. I only know that it's incorrect if I choose the test, uh, test data properly. Code coverage doesn't show me this. Yeah, yeah that's another example um, that um, code, code coverage can only tell you whether the code was or was not executed. It certainly cannot tell you whether the expected result of your test was properly defined. Um, this is a, a, a problem that, that sometimes, or a mistake that sometimes people make. It, there's this issue of, if you're not familiar with this term, what's called the test oracle. And basically the test oracle is the thing that you refer to to determine whether the, the test, um, uh, the result of the test is correct or incorrect. It can be requirements, it can be design, um, it can be any number of things, but it cannot be the code itself. The code itself cannot tell you um, what the correct result is, because if you base the, the your your definition of the correct result of the test on the code itself, you're just testing that the compiler works. You're testing that the compiler does what it what it says it does. Now, if you're testing the compiler, that's all well and good. But assuming you're testing the application itself, then um, you need some something other than the code to which you can refer uh, to define the the expected results. There there are some test design tools out there that uh, say that they will help you work through um, uh, this process of selecting the data and defining the test result. But this, with, with all due respect to the people involved, and I know some people have been involved in creating such tools, and uh, their heart's in the right place, but I've never seen one that actually did a decent job of solving this Oracle problem automatically. Ultimately, this question of you know, what's supposed to happen when I do X is something that the tester has to figure out. Um, let's see. Um, other other questions here. Uh, um, Srinivas asks, as I understand, these techniques are used to write as few test cases as possible and cover more code. Um, hmm. Well, I think the way that I would put it, Sri, is that um, what I want to do is use code coverage techniques uh, to <clears throat> as a measure of the uh, thoroughness of my tests. And when my when the code coverage techniques reveal uh, things that haven't been tested, either statements or decisions or um, the MCDC world conditions that uh, haven't had a chance to uh, influence an outcome, uh, whatever those things are, when code coverage 
reveals things that are not tested, and I look at those and say, you know, we really should test that, I'm going to add a test. Um, you, you don't want the code coverage um, metrics to become like a, sort of a um, god or something, and you say, oh, we, we absolutely have to do this. I mean, you want to be flexible and say, you know, there are there can be circumstances where we're going to get less than 100% coverage in certain areas. Like I mentioned, the example of you know 100% statement coverage sounds like a good goal, and it seems like that should be a general goal. But you have to understand you know, there can be situations like exception handlers, or it would be very very difficult to create the exception where you might not be able to uh, get to that level of coverage, and and that that might be that might be okay. So um, in terms of like minimizing tests, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we always want to do that because there's, this is the central problem, one of the central problems of testing is that, that there are an infinite number of tests that we could run, and we're not going to run an infinite number of tests. So there's a selection issue, right? So we're always selecting. And that, that comes back to, again, you know, you don't, don't just say, well, we have to get to X level of statement coverage or decision coverage or whatever in some arbitrary fashion because that might or might not be appropriate. Um, let's see. So, um, Anthony has, um, puts up this, uh, expression here. I'm going to see if there's a way that I can, like, I can, uh, show this. Um, let's see, paste, uh, um. Hmm. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to show this, so let me read this out here. And you've got a paper or pencil um, and a, or pen, and I have to write it down. So this goes uh, uh, open parens, open parens, A or B, close parens, and C equals D, close parens, close parens. Um, a or B is that one is one condition um, is that an atomic condition um, or not okay so what are the atomic conditions there if we have a or B and C equal D um, so basically it, let's assume that um, Anthony that a is a boolean variable takes on a true or false value, and B is a Boolean variable, takes on a true or false value. So A is an atomic condition, and B is an atomic condition. Now, C equals D, um, where the equals is the, um, the relational operator equals. Let's assume that C and D are both integers. Then in that case, C equals D is the third atomic condition there. Um, so basically, when, when you're looking at um, a, an expression such as A or B, if we can break that down into pieces where um, th those pieces have a true or false value, then, that, then those, those, those pieces are the atomic conditions, not the overall expression. So A or B is not an atomic condition because we can break that down into A and, and, and along with B, um, each of which evaluates independently to true or false. C equal D is not that way because C is an integer and, and D is an integer, so they don't have true or false value. Now, uh, for those of you with a C programming background or C++ programming background, you might say, well, wait a minute, I mean, you know, when I understand how logical evaluation works at C and, and um, I actually could assign a true or false value to um, C and D based on whether they're equal to zero or not, but that, that's that's not what's meant here. Okay, that's that's um, now you're getting into the implementation of the language. So I hope that helps clear that up. Um, let's see other other questions. I got a bunch of them here, so I want to make sure I plow through them. Um, Uh, let's see. What do we got? 
Um, Kelly asks, hi, if this webinar is recorded, is it possible to send me the link so that I can review it because I missed the beginning? Thanks. Uh, yes, the webinars are recorded, and the recordings are posted on the RBCS Digital Library, usually within um, two or three days of the webinar itself. So um, what you want to do is come back to the rbcs-us.com website and um, go to the Resources tab and then navigate to the Digital uh, Library and you will find the recorded uh, webinar there. Uh, Anne asks, uh, please explain the term atomic condition. So I just went through that example from Anthony, which I hope helps. But uh, just to define it, um, atomic condition is, um, well, atomic, as you know, means something that is, is, cannot be further subdivided, right? Basically, it means that your atomic condition is you're looking at an expression or a variable or something like that where that expression or variable evaluates to true or false. And if you tried to break it down any further, either you couldn't break it down any further, or the constituent parts that you would break it down into would not evaluate to true or false. They would be strings or integers or floating point values or some something other than a logical uh, variable. Um, Ken asks, are there tools that analyze code and um, emit or highlight the lines that, that are required for MCDC test generation? Uh, uh, yes, there are. Um, and some of our clients in the safety critical world have used them. I'm not familiar with the names, but um, you know this is easy enough to find on the web. Um, find code coverage tools, and then when you're evaluating their capabilities, if you if you want to have MCDC coverage capability, just look for that. Um, let's see, somebody asks here, uh, can you be said to accomplish any measure of code coverage if you are never given the code to look at, but instead must simply exercise options that you see in the GUI? And the, the reason I said somebody um, asked the question is because a person entered their ID as X, 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 X. Um, um, so <laughs> I'm happy to answer your questions by your actual name, but if you don't give me your actual name, I really can't. Um, anyway, so th th back to this question, can you accomplish any code coverage measurements if you're not given the code to look at? No, no, that would not be possible. In order to do this, in order to measure code coverage, you do have to have access to the code because what you're going to do, you're going to produce a special version of the test object, the, the software under test, um, using the code coverage tool. Now, typically the way this works is that you run what's called an instrumenter on the code and it inserts uh, special statements into the code that are supposed to be as unobtrusive as possible and then um, those um, those pieces of, of code, those instrumentation pieces of code as you're running your tests make entries into a table um, and uh, then you have an analysis tool that after you've run your tests, you're able to look at the results of the analysis. And that's going to tell you um, what levels of coverage have or haven't been achieved. And in fact, most of these tools are going to actually allow you to browse the code and identify untested statements, untested decisions, untested uh, conditions, and, and so forth. But you do have to have the code. Venkata asks, is code coverage done primarily by developers during unit testing or testers after it reaches the test cycle? Um, uh, you, well, you can, Venkata, use code coverage during system testing to get a measure of how thoroughly your tests are covering the code. Now, that is often a very eye-opening experience. Most uh, people who've done this at the system level find that like 20 to 25 percent of the code um, is uh, is tested. 20 to 25 percent of the of the uh, statements. Um, now, is that a problem? Well, it, it depends on what you haven't tested. Um, but usually, achieving a high level of white box test coverage during system testing is not the is is not the goal. The goal. The goal is going to be that at the unit level, as you mentioned, the developers are going to try to thoroughly exercise the, the constituent code itself 
so that when we get into these higher levels of testing, um, we can um, we can focus on the behavior of the system. Um, but you know, if if the if, if thorough unit testing has not occurred, then you sort of have a problem here because it's quite possible that you're going to go into production with code that has not been tested at all, pieces of code, and statements that have not been run, decisions that have not been uh, tried out, both true and false, uh, loops that haven't been exercised, and that's, you know, you're going to then get, you're going to have a lot of bugs get past you. So it really, it, it, it is important that at that the unit level, that this appropriate levels of coverage be achieved, and also that you, you as a tester, if, you're, if that's your role, if you're running independent tests, be able to have an intelligent conversation with uh, programmers about the level of unit testing they did and um, how confident they are in, in terms of, of their coverage. Um, So Janet is asking, um, can you show the metrics again? Well, um, what I would um, ask Janet is that you go back through the, um, the presentation. And if you, you want to re-review the, the different metrics we talked about or listen to the recorded version of it, if you've got a specific question about uh, specific uh, metrics, just go ahead and send it to me, and I'll, we'll go back to that specific metric. Uh, Shri asks, uh, what's the difference between decision and condition coverage? Okay, so let's let's go back. Let's go back to that. Just, just out of the, out of the way there. Um, okay, so condition coverage. All we're saying in condition coverage is that. Um, Every atomic condition has to have been exercised once true and once false. So again, now this is you know you got to identify the atomic conditions, um, but you and then you've got to make sure that in your tests every atomic condition has been true at least once and false at least once. Now that uh, will not necessarily give you decision coverage. The decision coverage means that the overall outcome has been at least once true and at least once false. Like so let's take a look at this guy here. If D and F. Okay? So there are two atomic conditions, D and F. So I could get condition coverage by testing with D true and F false and then F uh, then D false and F true. Okay. Notice that D has been true and false, and F has been true and false. But it's your problem with that. If D um, D has been uh, true and F is false, and F is true and D is false, that D and F every time has evaluated to false. So we have not tested the uh, decisions, even though we have tested the uh, uh, conditions. So I hope that makes that a little bit more... Uh, clear. Um, let's see. Uh, Lily says, "I cannot see the other questions, such as the current expression in discussion." Yes, that's that is a problem. Um, um, I could not find a way to display that uh, Anthony's question while it was uh, while I was discussing it. Um, I apologize for that, but. Uh, couldn't spend five minutes trying to navigate through GoToWebinar's um, capabilities while uh, while you guys were all on the line. Um, Ken says it's unfair to call wrong or missing requirements bugs because it is not the developer's responsibility to do to do other than code to spec. Conscientious developers might feedback questions on specifications, but should not. Uh, unilaterally take on fixing specifications. Hmm. Okay, let me see. How do I want to reply to that? Um, I don't think it's unfair to call them bugs, Ken, but I think it would be unfair to call them bugs in the code. Um, they are not bugs in the code. They are bugs in the requirements. If the requirements are incorrect, um, then um, that's a bug. Um, now, certainly I could not expect necessarily that the programmer 
would know better than the business analyst or requirements engineer who came up with the um, the the requirement. Um, so yes, I mean it's I mean, it's fair to say that if the if the programmer is given a flawed uh, requirement or user story or whatever, they're given bad information about what they should build. Then <clears throat> what they're going to build even if they build it perfectly, will be bad. Now, it's, that's not their fault. That's not, and, and, you know, I think this is, this is something we have to be really careful of in the use of the word like bug or defect or, or something like that, is that this is not about fault. And in fact, some people use the word fault or um, uh, use fault as a synonym for bug or defect. I, I've, I've avoided that um, specifically because when you start talking about faults, it sounds like you're talking about something that is someone's fault. Um, and that's just really counterproductive. I mean, generally, what you're looking at when you're looking at um, <clears throat> defects, bugs, call them what you want, is you're looking at manifestations of process capability, or, or lack thereof, basically. So if the requirements process is, is broken, however, whether you're agile or, or um, following a more traditional life cycle model, doesn't matter. If your requirement specification process is broken, you're going to get a lot of bugs introduced in the requirements. And um, those are going to then ripple through into the code and then be either code that's missing or code that has the behavior that is as specified but which is wrong um, and, and met thus is a bug. And that's and again, that's that's a process capability thing. You, you know, it's I think it's a it's a problem in our industry that leads to all sorts of evils that we assume that uh, bug equals bad programmer. And I'm, I'm sorry to, if it sounds like I'm picking on you, Ken, I'm not. Um, it's just that uh, we, we run into this with, some, with a number of clients um, and um, you know, really need to think about you know, what, when you're looking at a bug or you're looking at a collection of bugs, what those are telling you about is more often than not the capability of your software development process, not your people. Um, that that's that, you know the bugs are the manifestation of a process breakdown. Shree um, <clears throat> says thanks for going back and explaining the difference against between decision and condition coverage. So I guess that's clear now, Shree. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. Anthony says since some scenarios can slip through with decision condition coverage, would statement. Um, be the better choice since it would cover the statements in all flows. Well, no, actually, um, decision condition coverage, if you if you get decision coverage, you should get statement coverage, um, as long as you're careful to exercise every entry point and exit point in the code. In other words, there's no, no, um, um, no functions or, or um, uh, other, other like exception handlers or anything that have not been executed. Now, it's sort of a, of a I would say distinction without a difference, but it's kind of like that in the sense that if you're doing, if you're using a code coverage tool, um, pretty much all of them are going to give you statement coverage. Uh, in some cases, they're going to call it instruction coverage. In some cases, they're going to call it code coverage. In some cases, they'll call it statement coverage. But pretty much all of them are going to do that because that's the easiest one to do. Um, and most of them are also going to be able to do decision coverage for you. So you're going to be able to find pretty quickly whether you're getting 100% decision coverage and 100% statement coverage. And to the extent that you don't have 100% coverage in either of those areas, the tools will generally highlight for you fairly quickly uh, what you're missing. Um, now, condition coverage, some of the tools might give you that. Some of them might not. Uh, if you decide that you want to look at that as well, then you know make that one of the requirements in your, your uh, the tools that you look for. <coughs> Um, let's see. David asks, uh, what are some target metrics when using cover tools? If we can't get 100% decision coverage, is 70% a typical number? Well, I don't know. We've, you know, we've seen this with, the, with clients. I, I, I hate to just throw out a number and say, well, you should get this. I mean, I, mean, I, think, it, I think it's fair to say that during unit testing, what you would want to see is at least 100% statement covers because if you don't get that, then, then that means that somebody has written code that has never been exercised, um, which you know, could, 
it could contain a surprise. Um, and so, you know, I think that's that's kind of fair to say. Though again, you can posit uh, scenarios where there's something that you know just can't be reached for whatever reason. Um, <clears throat> decision coverage, likewise. I mean, I think it's you know good unit testing should should result in every decision being taken uh, both true and false. Um, now you start to get up to the higher levels like. Um, uh, MCDC coverage and so forth, and I mean, I guess you could make a case that that's not 100% necessary. But you know, a lot of times the code is has fairly simple conditions in it, and, and getting just decision coverage will actually get you to MCDC coverage as well because you've got very simple conditions. If you have complex conditions where you would have to actually add more tests, well, that's sort of all the more reason to get to MCDC coverage because that's a situation that could break where it's complex. But I don't want to throw out numbers and say, you know, that all code should be tested to this level or something because it's just too easy to come up with a, um, a hypothetical scenario where that rule breaks down. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, that's it's. Uh, I don't want to be. I don't want to be prescriptive about that. But, but you know, think about it, and you know. There, there are these these levels of coverage have been defined because there are bugs that have been observed that are associated with not getting to those levels of coverage. Um, so Ken's got a reply here, which I want to read real quickly to what what I said um, to the uh, with respect to requirements. He says exactly this is why I call coding errors bugs and allow them to get into the bug tracking system for repair by developer. Finding an under process for reporting requirements slash specs problems and converting those into new or revised code specs is something else. And B, I consider developer sanity maintenance a big part of my job. Um, okay, fair, fair enough, Ken. Though let me let me just point this out that if you if you track if you track defects in work products other than code in a different repository, one of the things that can happen, and we've seen this happen with clients, is that it's very difficult to come up with metrics on what percentage of defects are introduced at what point in um, in the process. So there really is a strong case for um, using a single tracking tool. Now it's tricky because obviously the information that you need to gather on a requirements defect is different than the information that you need to gather on a code defect. And you have to be to be careful with how you implement this. But it's it's really important that you be able to look at the software process uh, in terms of its, its defect capability and understand what's what's really going on. And without that common repository, it's very hard to do that. Okay, um, so that's uh, got a lot of great questions. Uh, once again, more, more than I had time for. Um, something to remember about this is that um, we're, we're always always looking for blog um, uh, ideas. So, if you send an email to info at rbcs-us.com, you want to post a like a follow-up uh, question. Uh, I'll try to get to it and answer it on my blog in the next few days. So we can continue the the uh, discussion and conversation there if if there's anything that I missed. Uh, to close this session, we'll tell you a little bit more about the resources that we offer. Uh, these webinars are run free once a month. Um, check our website rbcs-us.com to sign up. If you want a special webinar presentation for your company only of uh, this webinar or any other topic related to software testing, you can contact us at info at rbcs-us.com uh, or via our website. If you don't already receive our regular free newsletter, you can sign up at rbcs-us.com. By signing up, you'll get valuable discounts on consulting and training services along with a regular newsletter that includes a featured article and uh, a uh, featured article on software testing and quality and news about what RBCSS partners are doing lately. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, we are at RBCS uh, or twitter.com slash RBCS. And we're on Facebook too, uh, facebook.com slash pages slash RBCS dash INC. Do remember to check your email over the next couple days. You might be the lucky winner of a free e-learning course from RBCS. Your uh, attendance registered you for that uh, drawing, which will happen uh, shortly. Uh, check out my blog. That's rbcs-us.com slash blog. Um, uh, post comments or email me uh, about topics that you'd like to discuss. Uh, check out the digital library that has recordings of these webinars and, along with podcasts and videos. Subscribe to our podcast via iTunes uh, by entering RBCS podcast into the search string or see the videos and recorded podcasts uh, 
by subscribing to the RBCS uh, channel on YouTube. We offer these free resources as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we're a not just for profit company. This concludes the webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and hope to see you at future webinar events. Hi, I'm Rex Black, President of RBCS. Welcome to the RBCS YouTube channel. Hey, I hope you enjoy all these free resources that are available here. And do us one favor. We need to keep the lights on and we need your help to do that. So, when you need testing and quality related services, training, consulting, expert services, you name it, let us be one of the bidders on that next job. We don't expect to get all of your business, but we'd like to get a chance. Thanks and enjoy the shows.